Good afternoon, everybody. It's always hard after lunch, isn't it? So uh, we'll try and make this as entertaining as possible. It's an incredibly wide room. So uh, I'm going to try and share the love and make it to both ends of the room. So bear with me. Welcome to uh, this session. Uh, this is ABD 218, which is how EuroLeague Basketball uses IoT analytics to engage fans. So we all hope you're in the right room. If not, we need the numbers, so stay. Um, my name is Mark Teichtel. I'm the manager of Partner Solutions Architecture for Australia and New Zealand. I'm joined today by our partner, AGT, and their director of software development, Lasse Lehmann, who will be uh, talking a little bit later. IoT, as many of you have probably noticed, is absolutely transforming the way we live our lives. Devices like smart watches, smart bulbs, smart homes are becoming increasingly pervasive in consumer electronics, in industrial electronics, in things like augmented reality, virtual reality, flight simulators, high performance sports, motor car racing, aviation. IoT as a technology is absolutely transforming our lives. Who has a device in their home that controls temperature? A lot of you. If I would have asked that question last year, there may have been one or two hands. These technologies are becoming available because of the rapid reduction in price cost of these devices, but also because of the capabilities of the AWS platform and our partner network in order uh, has enabled us to deliver uh, to market solutions quickly and cost-effectively, leveraging these lower-cost uh, devices, enabling you to get them into your homes. Software stacks are also increasing in power. We're seeing the proliferation of artificial intelligence and machine learning, both software and hardware, in mobile devices. And we're seeing that also transform the way we live our lives. We now no longer have to touch smartphones in order to unlock them. What do we need to do? We just need to look at them. And these are in relatively cost-effective form factors that are accessible to the masses. These technologies are increasingly changing the way that we consume sports. And that's the key theme for today. We're going to look at how these technologies have made their way and are becoming also all-pervasive into sports. So in the past, if we wanted to go and view sports, what was our experience? We would buy a ticket to the sporting event, we would sit with tens of thousands of other people, we would watch the game, baseball, basketball, football, Australian rules football, being an Aussie, I've got to say Australian rules football, there we go, um, and we would watch. And the analytics and the insights of that game were just what we could conclude from where we were sitting in the audience. But nowadays, you can get fully immersed in the game. We have statistics. How far has somebody run? We have analytics. How is their performance today related to performance in other games? And how can we infer their performance in the future part of the game based upon their current performance and performances in the past? We can do this on our mobile phones, we can do this in the cloud, we can do this with consumer electronics, and we can do it with speed and at a price point and scalability that is now making this accessible to absolutely everyone. So the key point here is that IoT is not only changing the way in which we interact with our world, it's changing the way in which we perceive our world, and specifically for today, around sports. Some of the things that Lassa is going to talk about is how these technologies and how the AWS platform and the architectures associated with these technologies has allowed an organization like AGT to instrument an entire basketball game and to provide an incredible amount of analytics and depth to the audience in real time from a range of different inputs, whether they be visual inputs from cameras, whether they be sensor-based inputs, 
whether they be uh, historical trending data inputs, the ability to instrument sporting games and to provide a new depth of understanding and analytics is now available. And our partner AGT has built some incredibly rich and immersive analytics capability that we're going to dig in today. We're going to look at the architectures of these technologies. We're going to look at some of the design decisions that have been taken that have helped AGT to roll this out. And we're going to look at some of the choices that customers make that influence the design decisions that are taken uh, from an AWS platform perspective. How pervasive is this change? 30.7 billion devices are expected to be in the world and active by 2020. I give you just a moment to think about that number in proportion to the number of people there are in the world. And if you take that number and you strip it back to developed economies where these technologies are accessible from a cost perspective, the number of devices per person, depending on the analysts you speak to, ranges between 4 and 10. 4 and 10 internet connected things per person in the developed world. The AWS platform and the technologies that AGT have built on top of this platform are key enablers for consumption of deep analytic data on these platforms. And it's that accessibility, that price point, and that scale that really enables organizations like AGT to bring solutions that we're going to talk about to market. How big is this market? And again, we're talking about developed economies. $1.2 trillion market. It's an incredibly large market. The addressable market is large. They're in developed economies with stable political systems that you can quite easily tap into. And if you think about 1.2 trillion, you don't need a large double digit percentage to make this uh, quite an interesting proposition for organizations like the ones you work for to look at this and go, maybe, maybe there's some opportunity here in my deep speciality, in my specific business. AGT are going to talk about sports, but as I pointed out, the use cases for these technologies and the scale for these technologies are applicable across an incredible number of verticals. So have a think around your deep expertise, the deep expertise of your organizations and how you can tap in to this incredible market of 30.7 billion devices and $1.2 trillion. But what are these devices? We've touched on some high level things, but let's really dig into what do we see these devices being and what's common uh, around these IoT connected devices. AWS IoT, has anybody played with the AWS IoT service? Next year I want everybody's hands up. Fantastic service. Along with the AWS IoT service, we've launched the AWS button. It's a simple button, you push it, sends the AWS IoT message, uh, uh, the IoT service a message, excuse me, and you're able to act on that message. That may be take more paper down to the photocopier. No longer do you need a help desk to fulfill that IT function. You can use a very simple, low-cost button to do that. Low-cost embedded devices. The proliferation and the accessibility of Raspberry Pis, for example, is a great one. The Intel Edison has been another great one. The Arduino is another fantastic one. These are really low-cost devices that are easy to develop on, widely accepted in the developer community, that enable you to build out these technologies from a physical device standpoint. Wearable technologies is an incredible megatrend. Smartwatch owners, hands up, let's go, let's see. Last year, there'd be almost none. Prior to the launch of the iPhone, even less. Prior to the launch of this device, probably zero. So the rate at which these wearable technologies are being adopted is incredible. And some of the technologies that Lassa will touch on also goes into how you collect data from these sort of devices and include these wearable, uh, the data from wearable technologies into your analytics uh, pipelines. 
Home automation. The Amazon Echo is an incredible device that enables you to have a conversational interface with services in the cloud. We call these services skills. You can ask it to tell you a joke, and it will tell you a joke. You can ask it to set an alarm, and it will set an alarm. You can also ask it to book you an Uber, to read you the news, to play a game. This concept of home automation through conversational interfaces is another incredible trend that we see in this industry. These technologies are underpinned by the capabilities of the AWS platform. They generally focus in on delivering inputs into big data and analytics architectures that allow you to store data at scale, securely, and to query that data in the future, whether that be significant redshift clusters, which you could run an SQL query over, whether that be simply writing data into S3 and then using Amazon Athena to query that data without having to move it into a database. The data from all of these devices can be collected and stored at scale, securely, and queried for deep analytics. AI services. When we think about artificial intelligence, when we think about machine learning, and we think about deep learning, we also have to think about the ability to train these models. The ability to store data securely at scale and to feed them into deep learning, um, learning algorithms and to produce things like neural networks for machine learning that can be run on some of these devices starts to become enabled. So you can now start to build AI models that will give you real-time predictive analytics based on the model that's been built from the training data that's been stored in your big data store. And thirdly, the ability to leverage the big data and analytics, the AI, ML, and DL frameworks and capabilities into delivering what I'd like to call today sort of next-gen applications, like the applications that Lasso is going to talk about later today. These applications have traditionally been thick platform applications, thick client applications. They're now moving to conversational uh, applications where you no longer need screens. You have a conversation with the application to gain the data. But they're also moving into augmented reality and virtual reality, where you can put yourself in the middle of the action, you can put yourself in the middle of the environment that is being informed by the big data and analytics and AI services behind the scenes. So you can see that low-cost electronics, the pervasiveness of uh, the AWS platform, the access to consumer-grade um, devices that collect this data is really empowering the next generation of applications. Sitting over top of this is the AWS IoT platform, the Internet of Things platform, a end-to-end -end managed, secure platform that allows you to publish and consume data from these devices in a secure fashion and then to feed them in, that data, into any of these services, the big data services, the AI services, uh, and any applications that you might be writing. Now, why is this important? This is important because it's a fully managed service, and there is no need to manage a server. As we always like to say, the best type of server is no server. So we talk here about serverless architectures. The Internet of Things on AWS is a serverless environment, enabling you to quickly and securely roll out these technologies and to manage these technologies. So what are the services that are relevant uh, in each of these areas. Lus is going to go into the implementation and the architecture of these services. In the big data and analytics space, we think about Amazon Athena, Amazon uh, EMR, Elastic MapReduce, Amazon Kinesis, whether that be Streams, Firehose, or Analytics, and Redshift, the ability to store large amounts of data, data warehousing. In AI, We've got a couple of new services coming. We look forward to sharing those with you soon. But the traditional AI ML uh, services, Amazon Machine Learning, uh, is a great way to get started. Then we think about some of the higher layer abstracted AI and ML services, like Amazon Lex, conversational chatbots, driven by 
the same technology that runs the Amazon Echo, the Alexa voice service. Machine learning, poly, the ability to have text to speech that understands tone, that understands timber, understands whisper. And recognition, the ability to take images, do sentiment analysis on people's faces, object recognition. These are all the higher layer abstracted services that could be integrated into, uh, into your solutions. When we think about rolling out applications, we need to make these applications accessible to some form of backend. So we think about API Gateway and Lambda as a way to provide a standardized interface. We think about ElastiCache and DynamoDB as data stores. So I like to say these things are all better together. When you leverage these services together, they integrate nicely. They've been designed from the ground up to integrate nicely and they're all leveraged from the front end of the AWS IoT service. Internet of Things and Analytics is what Lassa is uh, going to talk to you about. Lassa's from AGT. I'm not going to take away his, uh, his thunder, but I will introduce Dr. Lasse Lehmann from AGT to uh, run you through the AGT architectures. Hey, welcome everybody. So let me start with a question. Who of you likes basketball? OK, that's quite expected as we are in the United States. Uh, so I like basketball. Um, but nowadays, I rarely make it to watch a game at its full length. However, I would like to know. I would like to know what were the most exciting moments. I would like to have things to talk about with, with other fans or with my colleagues. And that, uh, I would like to have something that tells me when is the best moment to tune in to a basketball game? When should I start watching? When it is getting the most exciting? And these are the things that we are trying to, to work on answering at AGT. So we are a private organization founded in 2008. Uh, we have a lot of experience in IoT projects of all sorts. And we have around 100 people in data science and engineering, most of them being PhDs, in locations in Israel and the United States. But our main R&D location is actually Darmstadt in Germany. And I'm the head of development there. And this is where we are building a platform that we call IOTA. IOTA is an IoT platform that understands complex physical environments through sensors, analytics, and artificial intelligence. So basically, it's supposed to be able to answer questions about the physical world. Like, when is the best moment to start watching a basketball game? So that you can skip the boring parts and only uh, care for the good parts and the most exciting parts. <coughs> However, we are not only working in the area of uh, sports and entertainment, but we have worked and we're working in other areas as well, like, for example, in the area of security, where we had a big public safety project in the city of Abu Dhabi, actually one of the biggest in the world. And there, you would like to have answers to questions like, are there any suspicious people with me in the subway, for example? We have worked with uh, German companies uh, that run cement crushers and molding machines in the industrial area. And there you would like to answer questions like, when is my main production machine going to break or is there anything I can do about that? We have run projects in the smart city domain, deployed system in Singapore, for example. And there's questions like, are there any illegal transportation services offered in my city and do I need to take care of that? And then there's the health domain, where it's around well-being of, of relatives, for example. And of course, and this is what this talk will focus on, the sports and entertainment domain with the questions I have opened with. So we at AGT, we built IOTA, which is providing the IoT and analytics part and platform that answers these questions. However, there's still someone needed to then build a solution, a customer-facing solution on top of that, that then puts that in front of a customer. And for this, we work with partners, and our partner for the sports and entertainment domain is a company called Heat Global, which is a joint venture of AGT and Endeavor, which is one of the biggest talent and event agencies of the world. Actually, you might not have heard a lot of Heat so far, but you will in the near future, because they will be very active in the sports domain, actually. So, and together with Heat, we are developing a solution for fan engagement together with the EuroLeague basketball. Okay, we're in the United States, but it's like the NBA of Europe. So it's the most important and most 
uh, exciting and best teams of Europe competing for the European Championship there. And we are building so a solution that essentially answers the question that I've raised. So what are the most exciting moments of a basketball game? When should I tune in? What is happening on the court? And all this using IoT and analytics. We not only tell when an exciting moment happens, we also create content about that and package it and provide it to the users. <clears throat> so I want to show you now an example of a content that we create in this solution. It is uh, meant for distribution via social or via an app and is uh, targeted at millennials. And it's something that we can do actually several times throughout the game, automatically created and um, pushed to uh, the consumers. I hope this will play out well because we have <laughs> You've seen how like IoT and analytics and what it provides can change the perception of such a moment or a scene in basketball. Um, however, creating such a solution is a quite complicated thing. There's a lot of things involved there and a lot of things that have to be taken care of. So you have to select sensors, you have to uh, provide the sensors that give you the right data that you need in order to create something meaningful. Then you have to make sense out of the data and create knowledge and insights uh, out of that data. And then you have to somehow act on the data in order to create something that is a valid IoT solution and it uh, adds value to the user. So as I've said, we have run a lot of projects in the IoT domain and we had came to the point that it makes sense to actually build a platform that enables that, that enables creating IoT solutions and addresses all the difficulties that uh, come along with this. So that's why we have created IUTA, and it basically provides all the aspects that are needed in order to provide targeted solutions in different domains. First of all, we have analytics. So basically, we have domain-specific driven analytics packages that are able to measure, for example, activities or sentiments, actions or behaviors of the different entities in the domain we are looking at. And then, very importantly, we package them into solution packages, so we have sensors plus compatible analytics packages that are ready to use and basically plug and playable for a specific domain. Another very important part is something that we call the world graph. It's actually a semantic domain model that models a given domain and tells us how the entities relate to each other in that domain. Let me give you an example. So for example, you have players. Players play in the team. Team has a coach, and so on and so forth. There's clubs, there's play by play, there's actions on the court, and everything is interconnected semantically. And you need that semantic knowledge in order to create uh, viable solutions. But we don't only have the semantic model. We also add all the data and all the inset in, in <laughs> insights that we gather over time into that world graph and then are able to put artificial intelligence on top to then do reasoning, run correlations or predictions on that data. <clears throat> and now I want to show you how this maps to the solution that we are creating for EuroLeague Basketball. So starting with the sensors, we actually most importantly equip all the teams and all the players playing in EuroLeague Basketball with smart shirts. So they are playing with sensors on the court. Then we have microphones and analytic cameras on the court. We have wristbands on coaches and fans, for example. And then we add to that play-by-play -play and other context information, for example, statistics that we get from the EuroLeague databases. And this is now what IOTA makes of it. First of all, it observes and measures the different entities that take part in the game, which are players, but also the teams. So how the players interact with each other and how the teams behave on the court. And then the coaches, and there's also interaction between the coaches and the teams and the players and the activity at, um, happening on the court, plus the fans and the family that we are monitoring in the venue or even in their homes. And then we add on top of that uh, context information like the play-by-play, -play, the ticker information, what's actually happening on the court in terms of fouls and free, free throws and shots, or information from social media. And for all that, our analytics are capable of measuring behaviors, emotions, 
physical aspects like how explosive the player moves, how much energy the team is spending, how is it correlating to the other team, how is it compared to other games, so the season so far and so on and so forth, activities and action and the overall pressure of the game. And this then enables us to create new metrics to create triggers when something very exciting or important happens, to create rankings of players like the best IoT player of the season, to create data streams or additional insights. <clears throat> now, I want to go a little bit deeper into the technical details of this solution. So first I give you a high level overview on how the solution is structured. Then I want to go a bit deeper into the individual components and finally show how this maps to an architecture and to actual AWS services that we use as a baseline and a basis to run our, um, our platform on. <coughs> Excuse me. So naturally, such a solution starts with an on-premise deployment. You have sensors, they are deployed on-premise, they are on the players. They're on the coaches, on the fence. But also, we usually have a gateway deployed on premise due to certain restrictions in terms of bandwidth. And we also, it helps uh, to manage everything and monitor everything, keep it in place. In addition, we run edge analytics specifically for streaming media, audio, and video for two reasons. First of all, it's bandwidth. Not all the arenas have a very broad uh, bandwidth connection that would allow for all the uh, videos to be upstreamed if you don't use the, the TV broadcast um, equipment, that is, uh, but also for data protection reasons. So this is always needed. So the on-premise part of the system yields raw sensor data and the edge analytics results. And then in the cloud part of the system, we have a data collection infrastructure that ingests all that data, pre-processes it, enriches it, and transforms it, and then feeds it into the analytics runtime, which generates all the insights and analytics results which is then stored in our world graph, where we have an API layer, which then can be queried, or you can subscribe to data streams or notifications. The consumer in that solution is the heat platform, which then does the automatic content creation, creates the user experience, the consumer workflow is modeled there and does the event management, um, and then provides the solution for the customer. However, the focus of this talk is on the left side, it's on the IOTA side, the IoT, and analytics side, and this is what I'm going to talk about now in the next few slides. So let's look a bit more into the data collection infrastructure. So it's a flexible data ingestion, processing, and monitoring infrastructure. We have a plug-in-based system to, to quickly add new input and output layers, and we have a rule-based system to allow various transformations for different input types, allowing us to uh, rapidly add new sensor types uh, into the system. What we also do there is enrich all the data with the semantic metadata, so with the semantics, so we know what is the player, who was wearing the sensor that we're getting the data about, what was the game, what is the context, and so on. And this enables us then to process the data, to create triggers again, to tell someone this is a very exciting moment now happening in the game. The main part, though, is the analytics runtime which is a highly scalable analytics runtime which runs uh, advanced tasks and analytics flows. So we have two modes, more or less, a batch mode and a streaming mode. For batch and micro batch, we usually use AWS auto scaling groups, but if you have actual big data challenges, we can also use Apache Spark. And then we have a pipeline-based real data streaming system for both data and media streams. Um, and for the media streaming, it's again, a bit differently structured because video and audio is always uh, a different um, topic. On top of that, we have an infrastructure, so that's a flow manager, scheduling, configuration, monitoring infrastructure that helps us to, to keep everything uh, running properly. <clears throat> and then last but not least, we have the data management layer and the APIs that are connected to that where we basically create a holistic view on all the generated insights. We have the semantic underlying model which models everything and sets everything in relations. And we have APIs which allow for semantic querying, aggregations, and notifications. And what you see on the right side of the screen is actually a sample uh, query that you could do in order to get something that you would need to create a video that I've shown before. So an example scenario here is that we notice that the crowd is going wild, actually. So the noise level is very high. So we go to um, the IOTA platform and query for different 
insights and index, uh, indices and um, metrics that we generate with our analytics. For example, it's the crowd emotion. So we need to understand what is the, the sentiment of the crowd. Are they happy or are they sad? And we get the attitude which we get from audio to determine whether they are booing or whether they are cheering because it makes a big difference if they are very loud uh, but happy or very loud but very unhappy with, which, with what is going on in the court. And then we get additional information about the players and the teams, like the, the energy that they are currently spending, and can make comparison and correlations between home team and away team in order to get the full view on the current situation. So and now this is how it then basically boils down into a generic architecture. So we have the edge data collection analytics part, where we have the sensors and processing units uh, for edge analytics. Then we have the on-premise system, where we can flexibly deploy most of the components of our system, like data collection as well as the small-scale analytics part, but we usually use it for data buffering mainly, pre-processing. Then we have additional data feeds like play-by-play, -play, context information, social media, and everything then is brought up into our main platform in the cloud running on AWS. Uh, where everything gets fused and we do all the heavy lifting at the correlations. And this has a management layer on the bottom, and then we have the analytics runtime with the different types of analytics, the management services, as well as configuration, logging, monitoring, and an infrastructure underneath. And then, last but not least, on the right side we have the consumers, which connect to the APIs, which is the heat platform, in the case of EuroLeague basketball, we have a few apps that help to manage the whole system, uh, query tools, or also third parties can connect to that um, openly. So how does that now map actually to AWS? So um, the on-premise gateway actually uh, is a Kinesis-enabled app, so we use KCL for feeding the data into the system. Then that means on the data ingestion layer we have Kinesis and Kinesis streams to get all the data in. And then we have the counterpart in the cloud on the data collection side that reads all the data and makes sure that it gets uh, stored properly in the cloud, which is also a KCL. On the data management layer, we have various technologies that we use for archiving. We use mostly S3. For storing results and raw data, we use Elasticsearch in case that we need to have results or data to be uh, available Faster, we use Elastic Cache, Redis in that case, and we also have some cases where we use Aurora. For the analytics runtime, the large scale is naturally running on EMR, and the other uh, parts are running on auto scaling group in EC2 because it's very convenient and very straightforward to use. As a communication layer, we use SQS, uh, like because it's a job queue where we basically distribute the jobs to all the processing components. And then we have, uh, in the management runtime, we use, uh, except for EC2, we use uh, CloudWatch and Lambdas for management jobs and for some scheduling and triggering. CloudWatch and uh, simple email service for the monitoring part. And then we have a whole bunch of services that we use underneath in order to bring up the infrastructure to manage permissions uh, and uh, do routing and uh, load balancing, for example. Now I want to dive a bit deeper into some of these components and talk about how we use AWS services for that, why we use them, and what are lessons learned and considerations that we have done while using that. So let's start with the data ingestion part, so the whole data ingestion streaming layer. So we use Kinesis Streams as the ingestion layer. We use S3 as archiving storage, so the data goes into S3 from Kinesis, and then we have a transform and enrichment step before it goes into Amazon Elasticsearch um, for further processing. So we use Kinesis as a streaming layer for data ingestion. Why do we use it? It's very convenient, it's easy to use, um, and you always have the one to seven day persistence as a fallback. I mean, usually things don't go wrong, but in case something goes wrong, you're happy that you have all the data there, and nothing gets lost. That, that's at least mentally a very convenient uh, uh, thing. And it also enables a lot of things on top, and there are a lot of other services that you can use, like streaming analytics with Kinesis Analytics or Firehose, and more services uh, potentially to come. 
some considerations and lessons learned on our part is on the right side, we worked a lot on optimizing the number of calls versus the size of our batches that we sent into Kinesis in order to optimize our throughput. So this is something that you need to look at. You analyze the load that you have and then uh, act accordingly. Also, you need to take care that your key values are distributed efficiently in order to make use of all the shards in Kinesis. Um, but this is also documented. And one tip for reading, always use the KCL. It's great. It's very convenient. Um, however, we had one case where the KCL didn't uh, support us the way we wanted to because we had a very thin data stream which we wanted to accumulate over a very long period of time. And then after some time, the KCL re reader would time out and uh, we would uh, basically not be able to uh, uh, keep the data. OK, then S3, which is probably most of you know anyway. So it's used as archive and raw data storage. It's managed, it's responsive, and it's uh, very well suited for large volume data, and it's really expensive and easy to use. Um, some things that might be helpful to know is uh, key randomness is very important uh, because you need uh, to have a good distribution on your keys to uh, have a good performance in, uh, in S3, which is also well documented. <laughs> um, and there's a security setting that actually can be very mis misleading because there's a setting that goes like any AWS user. And don't get tricked, this is actually any AWS user. So it's not the users in your company or something like that. So if you do that wrong, you might expose data to people that you don't want to have it exposed to. So <laughs> just for you to be aware of. Um, using MIME types facilitates a lot the access via, via browsers. And one thing that we learned is that the listing files, so the command to list files in an S3 bucket, is not a super performant operation. So we actually had a case where we were running analytics based on a lot of incoming files into S3. So you can get a trigger when a file is entered to S3. And then we would use that to list all the files, get the ones that we hadn't processed yet, and then uh, run analytics on top. However, the listing files was a bit slower than we expected. So then there you might need some, some ways to work around that. <clears throat> Last but not least, we use Elasticsearch for the storage of our raw data and also for the analytics results, which is time series data. So we are talking time series data here, and everything that I'm saying is, is relevant for that because it makes a huge difference uh, talking about Elasticsearch, uh, the type of data that you're using. So why do we use it? I mean, Elasticsearch itself is not... Uh, like an AWS product, but they have a managed service around, around that. And we, it's great because it provides for easy, easy scaling and monitoring, and it's very well integrated with other services, for example, CloudWatch. Still, there is a significant responsibility with the user. So specifically with time series data, you need to ensure that you roll your indices regularly. That means every, depending on how much data you get in, every few days, maybe even every, every few hours. Because otherwise, every new data point will take longer and longer to get indexed into, into the existing index. Also, you need to know your data a bit and adjust the bulk size of your writes to the machine sizes or vice versa. So you need to kind of um, know what you're getting and then adjust the machine sizes of your master nodes and shards accordingly. Also. The queries can do a lot of harm to your Elasticsearch cluster if you do them the wrong way. So if you write wrong queries, they can have a major impact on the performance of your cluster. And this will also impact other queries and other things going on. So you need to monitor them and tune them accordingly. However, AWS can help there. So it monitors the key metrics. And you can raise uh, CloudWatch alerts. Uh, and they can very easily be set up and triggered in order to, to make you aware of these things happening. One more thing that we learned is very careful with out-of-the-box data provider libraries. They're super convenient to use. So we, for example, use Spring and Spring Data for Elasticsearch. However, we noticed uh, at some point that Spring Data would do a refresh on the index on every write activity, which again triggers like a performance impact. And uh, you will basically, we needed some time to analyze why we would have uh, this, um, this performance impact or degradation after we use this library. OK, now let's take a look at another part of the system, which is basically 
the, the job queue that we use. So we have a scheduler that schedules tasks on a regular basis, which then are forwarded to the flow manager component, which then relays all the jobs into the auto-scaling group of dozens or hundred machines, depending on the load that we have, uh, where it's uh, taken on by process managers to be run. So we use SQS actually as a queue for our analytics jobs in some parts of the system. So why SQS for that is straightforward, it's managed, it's really scalable, and it's also very easy to auto-scale uh, EC2 auto-scaling groups using that, um, for example, the queue length. So if you have jobs in a queue, the longer the queue, the more machines you need to add. Some considerations, um, there's a limited message size and there's like a, a limit to the in-flight messages uh, concurrently possible, like 100,000 uh, at a time. If you reach that number, usually something went wrong with your cluster because you were not able to pick up all the jobs anymore. So uh, this is well documented. However, there's something which is not as obvious because there's a setting that says receive message wait time on every SQS queue. And you would actually expect that if you set that to zero, messages would be picked up faster which is not the case. So actually it's 10 seconds is a sweet spot where it goes from short polling, where the clients actually poll uh, in the round robin way from every, uh, I think, region or availability zone to an asynchronous delivery of the messages, which happens uh, when you set it to 10 seconds. So this will speed up the consumption of your message um, very much if you consider this one. Uh, to my knowledge, this is not so well documented. <laughs> Um, yes, and one more thing which is not mentioned here, uh, regarding uh, uh, managing your auto-scaling group, scaling up is always very easy. You get more messages in the queue, you get more machines, easy. So, but scaling down is not as straightforward always because if you had zero messages, you never know whether you have too many machines or you have exactly the right amount of machines. And if you do that too rigorously, you might end up in a situation where you actually remove a machine and then it queues up again and then you re-add the machine and then it goes down again so you get into that cycle so that what we do there is actually to kind of relax the time frame for downscaling so we put it to several hours and then we will have that situation very randomly also you can use uh, CLI in order to write your own solution for for that but it, this is uh, good enough from our perspective okay then let's take a look at Amazon CloudWatch we use it for several things uh, foremost monitoring, but also we use it to schedule jobs in our system. <coughs> so for that, we use uh, CloudWatch rules that then trigger a Lambda, that then, for example, set up the scheduler in order to uh, put some jobs in a queue. And we use it for high-level monitoring of our system in general. We usually put some uh, other component in place, like Zabbix, in order to monitor all the low-level metrics and aggregate them so we have a convenient uh, way of monitoring our system in uh, CloudWatch. Why do we use CloudWatch? It's easy to use. It's very well integrated with, with all the other services in AWS, and it's the way to go uh, for monitoring. And it's also a very convenient solution if you want to set up something that is to be triggered on a regular basis, for example. However, some things that, that uh, we learned along the way that there are some limits to triggering uh, rules in CloudWatch. So you can not go be, uh, below one minute for uh, regular triggers. And also we had a situation where we, where we wanted to trigger analytics using CloudWatch, and then we had like 3,000 rules in parallel, which kind of is not exactly what Cloud, <laughs> CloudWatch is uh, designed for, so uh, we then found other ways to do that. However, we still use CloudWatch triggers to run, and this is what it's very well suited for, to run, for example, regular maintenance jobs on our cluster, like rolling Elasticsearch indices. Um, also one more, Thing which is helpful, you should, uh, we use, as I said, Zabbix to kind of aggregate the, the low-level monitoring and it helps as well to kind of further reduce the costs for CloudWatch, uh, which is associated to, to monitoring. <clears throat> so, and last but not least, before uh, I want to conclude my part, I want to uh, look into our deployment and delivery pipeline. So we use for source control and for deployment and build, we use uh, Atlassian, so we have source code repositories, we have a bunch of builds connected to that, and then we, the, the software artifacts and packages go into Nexus, and from there, we use a combination of Ansible of AWS CloudFormation in order to build and deploy and upgrade our system seamlessly and very performantly. Why do we use CloudFormation? I mean, 
it's uh, the straightforward choice. It's made to deploy and upgrade AWS infrastructure. It has a great performance, specifically since uh, they introduced uh, Delta patches. It's very easy to replicate existing infrastructure. And the integration with tools like Ansible um, uh, make it very nicely because it complements uh, CloudWatch capabilities uh, very well. So with this uh, um, queue, actually, with this pipeline, we are able to deploy a new system with one click, automatically a new version within minutes. And actually to replicate an existing cluster, an existing deployment of the entire platform within less than, than one hour. So to spin up a new instance of the whole platform is really an easy thing to do. There's a lot of configurations around that because we did work a lot on that to automate everything, to make everything work. So just a few tips um, that might be helpful there. Um, I picked a few from, from the bunch that we had. So for example, for Lambda functions, it helps a lot to have a convention of renaming them when upgrading them, for example, with a version tag, because that facilitates a lot the deployment and update process. Because sometimes it takes a while until an existing Lambda function, function is deleted from, from a VPC, and that might, um, if you automate everything, that might um, create problems with your automation process. Then what we do in order to make sure that we can uh, upgrade everything with, uh, without downtime, we uh, update the images on the fly, and then we scale up the cluster. And when you downsize the cluster, again, all the old images are thrown out first. So after scaling down, you're sure that your cluster is up to date fully again. And then um, in the IAM, uh, all the policies that you create there for permission management and so on, they are created on the fly, but it takes a while to replicate them across availability zones and regions. Um, so if you have an automated deployment process that relies on policies to be there, then you should uh, ensure that there's some, some time that, for waiting for this replication to happen. Otherwise, your deployments will be flaky and go red once in a while, and you will not understand why exactly. And then the, the classic is the EC2 class uh, CPU credits exhaustion that, that we were hitting one or two times when we were going from a very I.O. heavy um, a way of doing things. We optimized the performance there and went into CPU heavy side and then we hit the, the credit boundaries. Uh, but there it's just to, to have in mind that this credit exhaustion exists and change the types accordingly uh, that will solve this. Okay, let's look into where we are heading um, within the next few uh, uh, like releases of IOTA in terms of AWS services. So we, we have already a bunch of services already that we use and that are very helpful, and we are looking now into even more services. Actually, we have started already to use Kinesis uh, Firehose because it's uh, very convenient, well connected to get the data into S3, for example. Um, we didn't do that before because we wanted uh, to have the data well structured in a certain way, and this is... Um, not super straightforward with Firehose, but since now Athena is available in our availability zone in our region, uh, and we don't need that, we don't have that requirement anymore because we can just use Athena to do, to do SQL queries on the data and structure it the way we want that way. Then we are also looking into Kinesis Analytics to provide that as an additional source uh, for data to be directly read, read from Kinesis, specifically for the streaming pipelines, and then in a more uh, midterm way, we are revisiting AWS IoT. So we, we checked it out when it was very, very new, I think one and a half years ago, if I remember correctly, and we decided that we don't want to go in that direction yet, but we will revisit it and um, also that decision. And then even more long term, we are looking into using Greengrass for uh, supporting the on-premise development with, with uh, AWS services. So now to wake everyone up, because that was the, the technical part of the session, I want to show another video, um, again, uh, automatically created, uh, targeted at social media or uh, an app scenario for millennials. That's actually the target group that we are looking at. And it basically shows how we use analytics in, to enrich, again, uh, the consumption of, of sports, and not only to find out when there's an exciting moment happening. Let's hope it plays. There it goes. Ah. 
Okay, now let's take one look before I hand back to Mark. <laughs> um, how do we uh, multiply this? So how are we able to cope with that? I mean, we are not a very big company. First and foremost, it's uh, AWS infrastructure and services that enable us to do that. So uh, they are elastic, so they take away all the uh, overhead of scalability. They are managed, so there are a lot of managed services. So we are able to actually run, operate, and deploy everything with a very, very limited capacity in terms of DevOps. It's great, they are reliable, fast, they provide a great return on investment, but you all know that, so <laughs> um, I don't need to dive into that. But then we have like the IOTA core platform built on top of that. So this provides all the components that we've talked about, the data collection, the main analytics runtime, and the core of uh, what we call um, the world graph. And then on top of that, we actually build domain layers for solutions, which are generic for a specific solution domain. And these, these contain then specific tooling, for example, in the sports domain, they contain a semantic ontology extension to, so that we have the knowledge of what are the entities in sports and how do they relate. And first and foremost, this, they uh, contain solution packages for that domain, and that means sensors and analytics. And this is not generic analytics, like you find them, for example, in the machine learning of AWS, or another platform, it's actually targeted domain-driven analytics that do um, that provide cognitive skills or emotional skills based on, uh, for example, pre-learned models. And then on top of that, we build then an IoT analytics part of a solution for sports, and we did that for basketball. Uh, we are doing it for martial arts and bull riding. We are looking into skiing and soccer as well, and we, will we were able to do that in a very short time frame with a very limited team because of the underlying layers that we provided and that had us a lot of, uh, enabled a lot of reuse for us on our side. And we are also building these domain layers for other domains like smart cities, like the health domain, the industrial domain, or the security domain. And this enables IOTA to answer questions like the one I started my presentation with um, in all these domains questions about the physical world. So, and before I hand over to Mark now, I want you to think about whether there's any question in your domain that you might have. And if you think that maybe IOTA can help answering that question, feel free to contact me after that talk. Thanks a lot, and now Mark will conclude. Thank you. Okay, that's better. Um, fantastic use case. Uh, the thing that really strikes me about that use case is the simplicity of the way the services are consumed, but the power that it unleashes. Uh, it's incredible. This is my nut cracking slide um, that IoT and analytics solutions can be complex, they can be a tough nut to crack. One of the things that you've seen Lasse do is decompose down to the individual elements. And one of the things we really wanted to communicate today is the, this art of decomposition down to specific um, AWS services within the context of the capability that you're trying to um, take to market. So I encourage you all to decompose a problem. Uh, break it down into individual services and tackle them architecturally one by one. But with this uh, structure, it can be a challenge. So in terms of decomposition, we want to look for the smallest manageable unit that you can deploy in your architecture to deliver the outcomes that you would like to deliver. You want to make sure that these smallest quanta or smallest units simplify your testing. You saw Luster talk about like a deployment pipeline. Within that, we want to make sure that we can test, so our deployments are regression tested and stable and easily troubleshooted. And we want to use decomposition to enable scalability, so we can quickly and easily assemble these components that have fallen out of the decomposition activities. We want to be decoupled. We need loose coupling between our architectural components. We need logical, functional blocks of capability that have clean interfaces and that are loosely coupled, so they can be swapped out, they can be upgraded, that they can be enhanced as uh, your requirements and your customer requirements change. And thirdly, 
we want to distribute. So we uh, heard Lasse talk about um, how messaging is being used uh, for uh, a bit of a control plane. So we want to leverage messaging and notifications and that becomes important in a loosely coupled system. So messaging and notifications becomes key. That avoids um, tightly coupling the uh, inputs and outputs of these decomposed elements of the solution. Try to avoid on-premises dependencies. As Lasse pointed out, there are specific use cases where it makes sense. So we're not saying don't do it. That's not what we're advocating at all. We're saying be conscious about making the right decision for what does go on-premises. And keep repeatability up. Deploy through cloud formation, deploy through repeatable processes, which will enable you to keep up uh, and accelerate uh, your velocity for your customers and your development cycles. I'm seeing lots of photos being taken, so I'll wait a second. And the right platform to do this is AWS. Why? Elasticity of the platform. The ability for the platform to provide you the on-demand scale with stability and security. The ability to enable you and your customers to have increasingly accelerating velocity for your feature development and your capability deployment to do that uh, in a repeatable fashion and to do it securely. And finally, utility. The AWS utility model enables you to deploy capabilities in an on-demand fashion where you only pay for what you use. So hopefully today, what we've been able to show you is the trends that are going on in the marketplace, how organizations like AGT are taking these trends and demands and turning them into incredible products that are enhancing the way uh, viewers and consumers are taking on board uh, sporting activities and giving you some food for thought around the things that you should be really keeping your eye on and paying deep attention to as you consider rolling out some of these technologies and architectures for your own uh, customers and, uh, and partners. So with that, we've come up on time. I thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon. I hope you all enjoy the coming few days. Have a great replay party. It's gonna be a great, uh, a great evening. Uh, and I hope to see you all again soon. Thank you very much for your time.